be teaching our children in this culture today is integrity. So, well, just how does that fit together with this whole cyberbullying type thing? If we take a general definition of what integrity is, uh, and we went to the dictionary and looked at it, we see it's things like this. One, adherence to moral principles. Okay, not surprising. The quality of being unimpaired or being sound. And three, unity or wholeness. Now, the second two of those things, usually we apply them to structures, the integrity of a structure, something not so much to a, a living uh, being. But all three of these things really fit into the heart, mind, and soul. Uh, and we'll see that as we go along and put this together. Now, when I say integrity, there's uh, a number of things that may come to mind. You might think, uh, well, somebody who's true to the word, uh, somebody who's honest, uh, somebody who does what they say, maybe you think work ethic, you know, somebody who when they go to work they're not slacking off, they're doing what they should do. And uh, that's kind of where I would go if I was thinking. And then when I looked at what Jesus had to say about integrity, I found that he took a whole different turn. It was a, a different direction that I didn't really expect him to take. When we look at what he says about integrity, it really doesn't start with a lack of moral principles even though those are involved. It, it doesn't start with, with work ethic, per se. But where Jesus started 2,000 years ago, before we even knew what electricity was, hit right dead center in what we see going on among our children today, in, in this whole idea. And this lack of integrity, as according to Christ, is actually leading to the death of many other people. In our day, so so where does the biblical integrity fit in? Well, let's let's just overlay the two. We know a general definition. Now let's go into to uh, what Christ had to say, and it's an inter interesting place. You probably know it if you look in, into Scripture as the Sermon on the Mount, and, and there's all kinds of stuff there in Matthew chapter five. But Matthew chapter five, if you read that chapter, what it really is is a whole discourse on integrity. You want to know what God thinks of integrity, it's all in there. And it's really kind of in a cool way. Because <clears throat> Jesus isn't saying really anything new. When he was talking to the people, it was all stuff entrenched in the culture. People knew these things. He was just saying, saying them in a whole new way. And as he began to speak in a new way, he kept telling them these things about integrity. And, and integrity was... Uh, how we deal with anger that's thrust at us and deal with it with grace. He was talking about integrity, dealing in personal conflict, if you look at it through the chapter. Integrity was how you deal with women who aren't your wife. And integrity was how you deal with the woman who is your wife or your husband. Integrity had to do with forgiveness. It had to do with dealing with difficult people, those ones that, you know, um, some people are easy to forgive. If they come and they're all, all, all uh, in remorse over what they did, well, sure, it's easy to forgive. But what about the person who isn't? It had to do with all of this stuff, but it was all to do with integrity. And right in the middle of this big discourse, there's this funny little line he throws in there. He says, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no. For whatever else, uh, more than these is from the evil one. Let your yes be yes. Somebody asks you something, your yes is good. You don't have to swear on this and that and the other thing. And you know me not. Words. Integrity is tied to words. Jesus was really big about our mouths. If you go through and look through the Gospels, at the number of time, times that Jesus talks about our mouths, uh, you'll be kind of surprised. A number of little tidbits like this. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What words come out of your mouth? Your heart comes out of your mouth. But the words, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Your words are going to do both those things. Now, what goes into the mouth does not defile a man. What comes out of the mouth is what defiles a man. These are the kinds of things that, that Jesus was saying. Our words are directly linked to our integrity. How so? Because words are the product of your heart. You know, and, and, and this is something to keep in mind all the time for all of us. Because you, you ever been there and you go, why did I say that? You know, what, where did that come from? Well, you don't have that. It came from here. It came from 
the deepest part of you. And when we say something wrong, the real problem isn't even so much the words, it's the heart that produced the words. And that's where integrity comes from. It is a condition of the heart. And of course, as we say that, we're talking about the heart of hearts, the core of who you are. And any time we go there, any time what we're talking about goes to the heart of hearts, we're not talking a social thing or a legal thing. We're now in spiritual territory. That means integrity is a spiritual condition. It is a spiritual condition. That's big implications. It means uh, it goes beyond work ethic. It goes beyond uh, how social, socially savvy you are. It goes beyond your moral code. It is who you are. If you look through that chapter, uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, uh, Matthew 5, if you look at what he's saying, who he's talking, he said, blessed are the humble, blessed are the righteous, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure heart. All these things aren't things really that you do or things that you agree with. They are things that you are. It comes to the heart. You see, even on the moral code that you follow, you know, that's not the last level of you. There is another level of you, a deeper level, that produces the moral code. Oh, I have a moral code I live by. Well, that's great, but what in your nature developed the moral code you follow? There's this deeper, deeper level that there is, and this is where integrity springs from, the heart, the heart. Jesus says this, if you understand what I'm telling you, he says, if you understand this thing about integrity comes from the heart, he says, there's a big promise if you have this kind of integrity. So if you have this kind of integrity, you will be like God. Like, not in authority and, and, and such, but in nature. You will be like your creator. And this brings us full back, full circle back to the original definition. See, if you and I are like the one who created us, if you and I are like we're, we're supposed to be, if we are in the design, then we will be whole. We will be uh, complete. We will be unimpaired. We will be uh, like the Father. We will be like God Himself. That's the promise. Integrity is pretty important. Now, just for a moment then, really let's just stop and think about God for a moment. Is that God is light and God is light. Uh, he doesn't bring it. He is that. So it's not surprising if we have a trait of God that where we go, we will bring light and light. Not only for ourselves, but for those under our influence. It's a real positive thing. And it all ties into this thing with words. When you saw the video, was there light and life in the words that were there? No, because there wasn't light and life in that young man typing the words. Why not? Because it wasn't in the heart. It wasn't the integrity that Christ was talking about. And the promise then was absent in that situation we were looking at. Light and life. Christ inside. Well, if that's the promise, what happens when a trait is absent? It's an important thing to look at because as we talk about these different values that we're trying to instill, we can say, okay, if it's there, this is, this is what you'll have. But what happens if it's not there? What happens if that trait is absent? If that value is absent? What happens if integrity is absent? Not, not our definition, God's definition. What happens? If anyone among you thinks he is religious, well, that's a wonderful thing. Uh -huh. But if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. Wow, there's an implication right there. You think you're the ultimate church person. If your mouth is out of control, you're fooling yourself. And your religion is useless. That's what James has to say. He tells us the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Well, a defiled heart produces defiled words, and the defiled words defile you as, as a complete being. There's a whole circle of defilement that goes on, and here it is, we're talking integrity, but it all comes back to the same words, words and heart, words and heart. Interesting. Matthew, back into what Jesus has to say about words. He says, I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, every idle word men may speak, they will give account on the day of judgment. I found 
found that a curious saying. I don't know about you, but I did because every idle word, we talk about idle chatter and everything. It's a benign thing, right? Yeah. So what is this word, idle word? He doesn't say every mean word. He doesn't say every bad word, every cuss word. He says every idle word. And you'll be accountable. And we'll be judged for it. So I said, I just got to see what this word means according to when it was written. So I went back and peeked at the, at the Greek meaning when they used this word idle. And what I found was this. It means to be inactive, to be lazy, to be useless, to be barren, to be slow. That is silly or foolish. <clears throat> now take that back into the day where we live. Everybody's running around with one of these, or most people are, if it's uh, in some version or another. Computers at home. I appreciated that for the uh, little, the little, uh, the uh, little promo thing they had on there. The the young the, fellow's not just using his computer; he's texting someone in one thing, and a powerful communication. There has never been a time in human history that we had the power of communication we're taking for granted today. Instant, global. It's an amazing thing. It is as powerful as any weapon out there. And we take this power and we plop it right in the lap of our 10 and 12 year olds. There it is. All this power. And then what starts is all the words. From the security uh, of the teenager's bedroom. From the uh, anonymity of their cell phone or their laptop. Just words spewing out of all kinds. Some of them are good words. Nice words. But in all of this, there's a plethora of idle words. Words that um, are lazy words. What do you mean by that? Uh, just go and look at anything where somebody has posted a serious comment and look at the responses. You want to talk about lazy words. No thought behind the words. Just, oh, that's it. This is my immediate impression. I never thought. And here they are. They're the words out there. What do I think of you? Well, I'm sitting in my room. I'm not looking at you face to face. So I'm just going to tell you the first thing on my mind. Blah, blah, blah. You know, off it goes. Does it hurt you? I don't know. I didn't put any thought in it. It was, it was a, a lazy thing. Destructive, useless words. I ask you, in, in that, that little video you saw, was there any use to any of the words that young man put out there? They were, they were useless. They were destructive. They were barren words. They were just causing harm. They were silly words. They were foolish words. But they were just shot out there and couldn't be taken back. And this idle chatter goes on all the time. 24 hours a day in social networks and chat lines and such. And not that I'm against chat lines and social networks. But Jesus says he's against idle words. And not Jesus as in let's get all religious. As in the design of the human being, idle words will destroy things will destroy people. So here's this dumping ground of idle words, and that is literally the playground of our children. Everybody goes there. Everybody participates. That's why I kind of pulled this whole thing a bit into the whole cyberbullying thing. And I just wanted to throw you out some, or throw out some facts to you on this whole thing, cyberbullying, uh, from a few different um, uh, research sites. <clears throat> one fact, cyberbullying is defined as one young person tormenting, threatening, harassing, or embarrassing another young person using the internet or other technologies like cell phones. Two, the psychological and emotional outcomes of cyberbullying are similar to those of real life bullying. The difference being real life bullying often ends when school ends. For cyberbullying, there is no escape. And it's getting worse. Nearly 43% of kids have uh, been bullied online. One in four says more than once. Over 80% of teens use a cell phone regularly, making it the most common medium of cyberbullying. 81% of young people think bullying online is easier to get away with than in person. Here's one for you parents out there or grandparents. Only one in ten victims will inform a parent or trusted adult of their abuse. It's silent suffering. Girls are about twice as likely as boys to be victims and perpetrators of cyberbullying. Bullying victims are two to nine times more likely to consider suicide. If we are judged for our idle words, has any generation, has any time been in more danger than where we are right now? 
whole thing. What's it really all about? Well, what I'm getting at here goes beyond simply. It's not an anti-bullying sermon. It's an integrity sermon. It's an integrity message. Bullying is just one symptom of one trait when it's absent. Now, the thing is, so far, hopefully, as we talked about this, just putting across an idea to you, a concept to you. This is an awareness issue so far. And that's great, but we need to put a human face to it, a personal face to it. What does it look like when an, a trait of God is absent in the culture? What does it look like on a human face? So normally, you know, I don't try and overload with videos, but I wanted to make this point, so I'm going to offer you a second uh, little video clip here. You know, the bottom line of this was, is still, like I say, isn't so much to point out the, the, the epidemic of this type of bullying that's going on. It's to point out two things. One, how badly needed the values we talk about will need to be people literally die without them. And the second thing is to show us what happens in a human level in society, in real life, when God is absent. When the values, the nature of God is absent. That's what we're looking at. And it's an amazing thing, really. Romans 6.23 said it. Here, here's the bottom line. It starts like this, where the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Do you know what, death, uh, what sin is? In the simplest form, sin is simply the absence of God. It's the absence of godly things going on. And every time God is absent, the same... Man, you want to test on whether something, which direction is coming from? Here it is, because the first thing to die is always the same thing, no matter what the sin is. And um, when I say sin, as I say, I'm just simply talking the absence of God in it. You can be talking addiction. You can be talking hate crimes. You can be talking uh, bullying. You can be talking anything. But it is always the first thing to die. And that thing is human value. Human value is the first thing to die. To die. People uh, lose the death of self-value. The death of uh, value of them. Do you know what I mean when I say them? It's there's always a them. There's us and there's them. And the them changes with every conflict or whatever's going on. But there's always them and they are devalued. There's a loss of human dignity. Then there, there's a loss of hope. And when you have a loss of dignity and hope, physical death is not far behind. And it will come either by persecution or suicide. Just watch world events and you can see it happen. It all comes down to this. Is the absence of God. And so this whole thing in integrity, we're just talking one value, one symptom from the one value, and it is leading to the death of our own children as we look at it. So how do you stop something like this? How do you turn the tide on something like this? Well, we've got legal matters that, uh, actions that we take. Well, yeah, I think that, you know, we have to have a, a social response. Sometimes there's the wrong response. There's violence in kind, revenge, that type of thing. Schools trying to find ways to deal with this. Software trying to find ways to deal with All these things, but you know what? At the best, what they will simply do is take something and drive it back into the shadows. It doesn't get rid of the dark nature. Why? Because it is a spiritual problem. The only thing that can get rid of it is a spiritual answer. And what we're dealing with here is not the presence of something, it is the absence of something. It's the absence of God's influence, the absence of God in a situation. And where there's not light in life, there can only be other things, death and darkness. That's what's going to come up. So integrity simply comes down to this. It's uh, according to Christ anyway, uh, the words show the heart and the actions prove the words. But words are in the middle of this thing. Heart and words. All in there, sandwiched in. Heart and words. And we're seeing <coughs> more and more in this life of instant communication where we and our children live. So, how do you spread integrity? How do you turn the tide? 
Well, Romans 6.23, we got the bad news part of it, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the strategy of all this, I'll be honest, as I sat down and thought, you know, the way to tell us is I'm going to go through the Bible and I'm going to find all kinds of how-tos and I'm going to present them to you as parents and grandparents. Go follow these things and you can help teach your kids and your neighbors and everybody integrity. And I was on this quest when I hit a, 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 a little uh, quote from a writer named James Baldwin. Children have never been very good at listening to their elders. And everybody so far, I like this James guy because he's right on. There he is. Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. Makes me wonder when I look at things with bullying is uh, how many of these bullies are second generation or third generation bullies? How many of them have learned from what's been done to them? How many of them are, are just simply acting out what they know? In all of uh, uh, this type of thing, we're communicating, we're seeding things into our children. And some of it's intentional, some of it is unintentional, but it's in there. There's only one way to teach integrity. Only one. Only one hope you have with your child. And is that you not have integrity, you be integrity. It is your nature to be integrity. And the things that Jesus mentioned, uh, then that is communicated. Now, we have to speak reality just because even if you have genuine integrity, that doesn't mean that your child will automatically have it. But I can tell you this, if you don't have integrity, if you are not integrity, there's very little chance of your child developing it on their own. You must be integrity. Integrity starts in the heart. And the heart has to be owned by Christ. And then the answers start to come.